I mean, that's kind of the ideal, but this is the sort of dark perversion of that ideal being pimped by the World Economic Forum, where it's going to be more about control, controlling the human population rather than freeing it. You're listening to The Corbett Report. James, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. No problem. Wanted to get you back on to talk about the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset. Uh, I heard about this when it first happened. It was shared with me. I wanted I wanted to do an episode on it, but just didn't get around to it. And really, the only person I wanted to do an episode on it was with you. So if you don't mind me just jumping right into this, because I know you don't have a lot of time and we have like a 13 or 14 hour time difference. So um Why don't we start off with what is and who are the World Economic Forum? You know, that's an excellent question. And I think for our purposes today, the most important uh, member of the World Economic Forum that we're going to be talking about is Klaus Schwab, who is, as one would expect, a uh, consummate insider uh, of the global jet-setting elite. Uh, One might say the superclass, if one was informed of such things as uh, David Rothkopf, who was uh, a Henry Kissinger associate, basically mini mini Kissinger, wrote a book several years ago called Superclass, where he basically said, yeah, you know, these crazy conspiracies theorists think there's just this handful of people that run the world. Well, eh, there kind of is. (laughs) There is this transnational elite who get to set the international agenda through not any particular organization, but just being part of these connected organizations like the World Economic Forum. And uh, Klaus Schwab, of course, is the, the founder and the executive chairman of that organization right now. It was founded in 1971. And of course, it's based in Switzerland. It's most famous for its uh, annual retreat at Davos. Uh, Every year, the world elite, quote unquote, get to uh, hobnob and shindig in uh, Davos and spend a week or two just basically attending different seminars and talking about the global agenda, which they like to think that they are setting, and perhaps they are. Uh, I think their uh, their official mission statement is to, quote, uh, they're committed to improving the state of the world by engaging political uh, business, political, academic, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and in industry agendas. And if that sounds like a pretty grandiose mission statement, well, you're starting to get the sense of what this uh, organization is aiming at. When you start looking into it, let me just, or here, here's a better question. You go to their website and they have things like Prince Charles says we need a global Marshall plan to save the environment. They're not hiding this. So you can click on their website. You can see the most, to you, for lack of a better term, new world orderish kind of plans that they're just putting out there and that they're detailing. If this website anyone can click on, anyone can go to, why isn't anybody reporting on this? <laughs> Well, they are. It's just that they report on it in a context and in a way that makes it 100% normalized. And you're crazy for thinking there's anything odd about this. Of course, the World Economic Forum once is this group of extremely wealthy and influential billionaires and government officials and what have you, princes and whatever else, who want are sell, out there saying in their own words, we want to set the global agenda. And yes, that agenda is for global government, a new world order as that exact phrase has been used time and time and time again by these very people. And I think probably the best way to visualize what we're talking about here, because it's hard to get your mind around that concept of this global, political, business, academic, industry, education, everything, trying to basically set a global agenda for all of this, not global government, global governance. It's a totally different thing. If you want to get your mind around that and actually have a visual view of it, you need to look at the, uh, I, I believe they call it the transformation map. Uh, so the COVID-19 transformation map. And people who are interested, when I post this on my site, I'll, I'll include the link. I'll, I'll send it over to you if you want to include it with your show notes. But uh, just to see what this looks like. And uh, essentially, this is one of those spaghetti graphs where everything links to everything else. Um, but around this concept of COVID-19, they have pl- plotted out 
absolutely everything that you can possibly think of. Some of the categories here, how this is going to affect, affect aerospace or migration, geopolitics, China, the US, you know, European Union, etc., automotive industry, geoeconomics, the future of economic progress, the future of health and healthcare, vaccination, workforce and employment, humanitarian action, justice and law, cities and urbanization, the Great Reset, values, inclusive design, internet governance. I mean, literally anything that you can think of is part of this graph. And every single one of those collects dozens, sometimes hundreds of different articles and videos all around the subject and how COVID-19 is influencing all of these different areas. That's that's one way. When you start clicking through on that and seeing all of these different connections and how th this has all been plotted out, you start to get the sense of what this really means. This isn't this isn't just rhetoric. This isn't just feel good nonsense that's being spouted. This is a coordinated agenda that's happening at a global level, and we better take this seriously because there are very rich, very powerful, very influential people who are taking this deadly seriously. You mentioned Klaus Schwab and back in I believe it was in June, they released a video talking about the Great Reset that went pretty wide. Uh, it went pretty wide in our circles. Of course, the, CNN wasn't reporting on it, but Prince Charles was in it. There was, I can't remember who else was in it, but everything that Schwab talked about, what's very interesting is that people on the World Economic Forum website started writing articles about what he was talking about. So one of the things he talked about was how banks can, can help companies restructure for growth. And he says, like, the banking industry has to walk the tightrope of balancing relief with financial responsibility. And this is the one that really got me. It's structured correctly. Pension funds and other long-term investors might be the patient capital, patient capital required to support local community businesses. What what does all this mean? What are they talking about when they're talking about restructuring banking? I think this is actually a window. It's a microcosm into what the larger agenda is. And uh, we see that in the constant going back to this idea of public-private partnerships and how, how we can continue governance, or not continue, but actually transform governance through public uh, entities relying on private capital and vice versa, and how those can mix and conglomerate in various ways. Now, it's funny because I think we used to understand that as fascism, or as uh, Mussolini more correctly termed it, cor corporatism, the, the merging of corporate power and governmental power. Uh, but now they're coming out and saying this is a, you know, this is a wonderful, innovative, public-private um, vision for the future. So the idea of public pensions being the capital that's going to be needed for funding various uh, public utilities and things, uh, these, are, these are the types of schemes uh, that are being dreamt of under this giant umbrella of public and private cooperation, which the World Economic Forum, I mean, that's plastered over everything they do. And I think the if there's any sort of overarching narrative to every single aspect of the changes that are going to take place as a result of this great reset that they're calling it. Uh, it is this, uh, it's the monopolization of and consolidation of power uh, in, in every field imaginable. Banking, certainly, but more broadly speaking, the monetary power is going to be consolidated under things called uh, central bank digital currency, CBDC, is the new buzzword. That's popping up absolutely everywhere. Uh, economically, we're looking at consolidation of the corporatocracy generally in fewer and fewer hands. A prime example of that, of course, prime example of that being, of course, Amazon, enjoying unprecedented success as everyone locks down essential workers and uh, various businesses are, are basically outlawed by the state. But of course, Amazon and the connected insider crony corporations are allowed to continue. So of course they thrive in this environment. Uh, education. Actually, here's a fascinating story that popped up recently because it really gets to the heart of where this is going, which is the digitalization of everything in the economy is an in integral part of this great reset, so-called. And what what does that mean when, for example, in education, as we now see, everything's taking place online because, oh, heaven forfend, people actually get together in actual physical meat space and share their icky germs. So we everything has to be done online. Well, what does that mean? What are the ramifications of that? Here's a, a good example. San Francisco State University was holding a webinar um, 
and what was the name of that? Whose Narratives, Gender, Justice, and Resistance, A Conversation with Leela Khaled, Khaled uh, which sounds like the type of thing a university would hold some webinar and, you know, 13 people would watch and it doesn't matter, right? But no, that actually had to be uh, deplatformed from Zoom, from YouTube, and uh, Facebook, I think, all got together and deplatformed uh, this this webinar in particular, and San Francisco State University in general, I believe, was threatened with this uh, because this particular, um, which sounds just like some sort of social justice webinar or whatever, but it's it's directed towards Palestinian resistance against Israel. So of course there was just the Israeli lobby freaking out about this and decided to cancel it. But think about the larger ramifications of that through the digitalization of the economy generally and education specifically. We now have these corporate platforms that of course have all sorts of backdoors into the government themselves that can literally stop education, webinars, seminars, whatever, from taking place at all because you cannot take uh, have them in, in actual physical space anymore because they're outlawed. I mean, that's just an example. And uh, I, again, my mind boggles at even trying to explain all of this because it's literally every aspect of our society from the economic and sort of the meta narratives right down to the individual um, examples of how we're going to interact with people in the future. They truly mean it when they say this is a global transformative event and nothing will be the same. Uh, this isn't rhetoric. Again, I want people to really try to internalize this. This affects everything from banking on down. I wasn't going to bring this question up, but when you mentioned the public-private partnership, this is something that's really been bothering me for a while. And the fact that most of my audience is going to be libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, agorist, big L libertarian, I think this is something they're missing. I think that in their ideology, in their pro-market, free market, capitalist ideology, which, I mean, I consider myself a capitalist, but I also understand Marx's definition of it. And I realize that's what we have now, basically what, what Marx described. But it seems like they want to hold on and be pro-business. And if you, you can't criticize these businesses because they're private and they're openly traded on the stock market. And I really think that this is where people who talk about liberty, talk about free markets, drop the ball, is they are defending corporations who are acting as government arms. And the the term that's used a lot about this is they're libertarians that they need to be laughed at because they're so simplistic in their thinking is that they don't realize that these aren't private companies anymore, but their ideology is that they have to defend the free market is with everything with until their last breath to the point where I've actually said that they won't mind being loaded onto box cars as long as those box cars are owned by Walmart. Yeah. You, yeah. Well, you, I, you I mean, raise some extremely can you speak to this? Yeah, you you raise some extremely important points and I think that's why we always have to be as precise as we can be with our language and there's always going to be moments of imprecision in anything in a, we're doing lexically, but capitalism is just Again, it's like socialism. It's like communism. It's one of these words that is essentially meaningless because it means anything. If you you have a you you have in your head either I am capitalist and I, I'm that's great, or I hate capitalism and that's the enemy. And whatever whatever you like is capitalism, or whatever you hate is capitalism. It doesn't mean anything in those sense. That's why I I would tend to define the system as it's as it's developing right now as state capitalism, and. Uh, that that is that gets I think a little bit closer to what what it is that we are opposed to, which is the as again the public private partnership. Again, they make it sound just so banal. I mean, we've heard that term all our lives. I'm sure I certainly have grown up with that term, public private partnership, and it sounds oh this is an innovative new pro no it's not innovative it's not new this is a very very old idea. It's the consolidation of power in crony hands with the sort of fig leaf of privatization. This is not what people I think are thinking of when they're depending, defending capitalism. This isn't it. This is state capitalism, and we cannot uh, really examine any of the in, uh, institutions that exist in that through that capitalist communist framework or whatever, whatever sort of 19th century no framings of this debate that we're, we're still going from, which are, uh, clearly don't pertain to 21st century reality. So I think that's one way that we can start to inject that into the conversation. If you're against state capitalism, well, I'm with you. 
I, I, I'm, I, I think I'm for capitalism, but I'm against state capitalism because that absolutely is the, the, the state that we, the state that we find ourselves in right now. And I think, uh, that, that starts to speak to what you're, you're saying. So, uh, let's, let's apply this to, to a, a, a particular debate that I see coming up over and over and over again right now. Uh, obviously in the space that we're working in as media purveyors, we're very concerned about free speech on the internet and the crackdown, for example, deplatforming from Zoom and YouTube and Facebook and what have you, because you dare to speak about Palestinian cause or something. Um, absolutely. This is a worrying thing. And so, uh, as you're saying, um, some people will simply defend these corporations and what they do because it's private. Some people will say, well, no, we need some sort of, these aren't private. This is government. So we need to regulate them. I guess the space in this debate I want to carve out is to say, uh, yes, this is part of the state capitalist system. And, and trust me, I've, uh, I did uh, The Secrets of Silicon Valley, I believe was the name of the podcast. If people want to check it out, I believe that's corporatereport.com slash Silicon Valley, but don't hold me to that. Um, I, I did, it's essentially a little 45 minute uh, documentary about the creation of Silicon Valley, absolutely through government and military essentially funding all the way, and all of these corporations that sprung up around the uh, the microchip revolution was were all in, in bed with the government in one way or another. So I'm well aware of this, um, but it boggles my mind that people think that the solution to this then is going to be what the creation of some sort of governmental agency that's going to come in and regulate these companies. And oh, don't worry, the, 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 we'll make sure that anyone who speaks about whatever 9/11 truth or Palestinian causes or whatever controversial. Uh, but you'll have a space on Twitter. Don't worry. We'll make sure that you get it. You're, and they won't be able to kick you off. What nonsense. What planet are you living on? The answer to this has to be the agorist approach. It has to be. No, we're going to carve out our own space because the internet still exists and it is not a monopoly. Of course, yes, they have 95% or 99% or whatever it is of the market share of the human population are going to these, you know, 10 sites or whatever they are, but they don't have to. And we can carve out our space for uh, agorist resistance within that. And that, that to me is the only, it's the only possible real solution. Anything else is is just playing around. And, y you know, you might, I guess, if you elect the right representative who creates the right council with it will rule over the internet in a benevolent way you might be happy for four years until oh my god the people i don't like just got into power how did this happen i never foresaw it what nonsense no clearly we have to take the initiative to to carve out our space and that's that's the answer to this formation of these state capital monopolies, we have to press into the gray and black markets. That is the only space for freedom. And if we don't expand them, they're never going to expand by themselves. They're only going to shrink. And if this crisis, this generated crisis that we're living through has taught us anything, it is that. It is that they are going to press on, on this in every way they have, pressing on that nerve of power until they can wrest every drop of resistance out of the population by mere fact that uh, uh, the digitalization of our lives leaves us less and less space for anything that is outside of the purview of the state, monetarily, economically, socially, in any way that you can think of, this is the time to resist. So sorry for that rant, but this, this is where this leads me. I, I think you're right. We have to identify state capitalism as the problem. But the answer to that isn't going to be communism or socialism. No, it'll be a benevolent state that will take over instead of the bad state. No, of course, the, the real answer to this is individual agorist action working together uh, with like-minded people towards carving out space for freedom. Getting back to the World Economic Forum <laughs> and, Sorry. And, and the great – no, no, I, I asked the question. So, yeah, I brought it up. So um, – and it was great. I mean that's what people needed to hear. That's the message I've been giving. It's like it almost seems as if people who believe in free markets don't want to criticize private companies because that's what commies do. And I don't want to be on the side of the commies. So, you know, thank you for that. And that is – the answer is going to be agorism and the counter economy from here on out. But on the World Economic Forum site, you constantly see this term that a lot of people have heard, but they don't know what it is. And they're constantly talking about the fourth industrial revolution. What are we talking about? What are they talking about when we see that term? 
All right, so this is a uh, network of of uh, related concepts and things. So um, we'll, we'll take this piecemeal. But if people want uh, this fleshed out, there's uh, an 11 minute video that uh, World Economic Forum put out back in 2016 to try to at least dip people's toe in the waters, and they put out a, a an article that helped flesh this out. Uh, essentially, the, 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 the premise of this is that the first industrial revolution was steam power and all of the things, all of the machinery and, and, and uh, creation of factories and what have you that came from that uh, initial harnessing of steam power. The second industrial revolution had to do with electricity and electrification of cities and what have you. The third indus- industrial revolution then would be communications technologies and computer revolution. The fourth industrial revolution, as they term it, is the uh, the bringing together of technology, biology, and the physical world, the digital, biological, and physical world, and the ways that those are going to be merged. And I, I, at one level, I want to say, well, this is akin to the transhumanist philosophy, the transhumanist goal that has been around for, for decades now, formally through the transhumanist association of we are going to merge man and machine. And this is that stuff that sounded like crazy sci-fi uh, fiction, I'm sure, when they first started this. We're going you know, to have the brain chips and whatever. But now, of course, we have Elon Musk. Well, it's Neuralink. We're going to... We're, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll put the, the electrodes in your brain and upgrade you and it'll be great. Um, but that's actually only one sort of one slice of what this fourth industrial revolution is about. Because again, uh, again, my mind boggles at trying to encapsulate what this is because it, in, it affects and impacts absolutely everything you do and the ways that you do it. Um, but one example or one way of getting a handle on this that will, I think, hit home for a lot of people is the, uh, the automation of the workforce, which obviously is a topic that we've we've been hearing about for decades now, but is really coming into view and even more sharply now in this generated crisis where the automation of the workforce is much, much more apparent is on the table. And uh, we see the ways that that's going to be pushed forward as a result of this crisis. And what does that mean? Well, again, that that transforms our entire perspective on on uh, employment and, and what is the purpose of work and what does it mean if half of the human population has no work. I mean, wh- what do we do about that and what have you? And and so, of course, we need a UBI. And the UBI, well, I mean, we can't just give it out. It'll be tied to your social credit. Or we can imagine the ways that this will play out. But that's just one example of how this fourth industrial revolution is going to utterly transform everything that we do and every way that we are doing it uh, through the Internet of Things and transhumanism and automation of the workforce and what whatever sort of science fiction Jetson type of idea you've ever heard in your life is coming together. Um, and interestingly enough, again, I think uh, there are aspects of this which will, uh, for any market anarchist or any, any agorist, would look at some of these ideas and say, well, Yes, that's what we need. We need to push through this revolution because uh, the Industrial Revolution, you know, of course, it was it was great for humanity in a number of ways. And, and ro- you know, people are obviously living a lot better now than they were hundreds of years ago. But it, it created with it a, an entire culture that was based around these mass factory production and uh, urbanization that was a result of that and and the, the sort of distribution methods that were required for these mass-produced products to be shipped all over the world. To, it was just, I mean, it's a ridiculous system when you think about it, but of course it exists because of the technology as it was coming together. Well, the the dream is, isn't the dream to have the 3D printer on every desktop that we are all our own manufacturing base now and everyone can be designers instead of being slaves at some machine or something all day. No, we can, we can use our human creativity to, I mean, that's kind of the ideal, but this is the sort of dark perversion of that ideal being pimped by the World Economic Forum, where it's going to be more about control, controlling the human population rather than freeing it. And and again, I think it's, it's, it's almost a, more about what is the conscious intention of the ways that these ideas are being pushed, and can we can we direct that one way or another? I like to think we can, because we are not spectators in this sport called history. No, we are the players. We are on the field right now, and our decisions are going to influence that right now. So that's why these things, again, that seem in one way not insignificant, but trivial, like 3D printing and what have you, yeah, the early iterations of this are not exactly revolutionary, but 
You know, it doesn't take a genius to extend this out a few decades and see the real bifurcation in the path. I mean, the path is forking right now, and we can go towards complete control of the human population or the freeing of the human population based on the same the same precepts and the same principles and the same technologies, but through a different ideology. One will lead you one way, one will lead you the other. And the World Economic Forum wants to make that path seem like the only possible path. I mean, what else can we do? We have to transform the world. All these technologies are coming together. So we have to organize a global governmental structure that will keep you safe and swaddle you in its loving arms unless you don't want to be swaddled in its arms, in which case it will crush you uh, like the uh, the devouring mother or whatever, whatever metaphor you want to get into. So again, sorry for the rant, but again, my mind boggles at trying to encapsulate the, the sort of vastness of these ideas in something that people will be able to understand in a nutshell. It's probably not surprising if I told everyone that the World Economic Forum has a great reset podcast. And the latest episode says, the the description is, the response to COVID-19 pandemic has shown the world's ability to diverge from business as usual to protect public health and safety. The question they sought to answer was, how can we carry that over to address the threats of climate change and socioeconomic injustice. Well, what does that mean? Uh, It means that the exact agenda that they have been pushing for years is not in any way disrupted by this event. It is only, uh, at best, it's just another excuse for pushing that agenda through. But actually, I think it's an excuse for pushing it about a thousand times harder and faster Um, People might have heard of Agenda 2030 and the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals that the UN put out. Well, this is essentially bringing that time frame up several years. So um, I I do recall that at the beginning of this uh, generated crisis, there were a lot of people saying, oh, this this might be the end of globalism. We've shown that it's, you know, prone to all these disruptions. I don't think so. I think this is their excuse to try to really clamp down. So, yes, um, for people who don't know, about this. Yes, the the sort of the buzzwords, the catchwords for global governmental structures of various sorts for years have relied on sustainable development and uh, climate change as being the excuses. This is not about the environment. This is not about saving Mother Nature. This is about control, control of the human population and control of the world's resources. And I could not possibly do justice to an elaboration on that fa- uh, that idea for people uh, just in a few minutes here. But if people are interested in this, I would direct them towards uh, my documentaries on how big oil conquered the world and why big oil conquered the world, and a f- subsequent follow-up podcast I did on what is sustainable development. Because unfortunately, if you're like me anyway, I was a I was a Canadian growing up in the Canadian public education system, so I was a socialist by default, and of course received all the environmental indoctrination just to love these words, sustainable, anything that had the words sustainable or whatever on them were just by definition great and wonderful, as opposed to tools for control and monopolization of the world's resources. Uh, one... One video that I would uh, recommend people take a look at uh, just to get sort of an idea of what this world of the the future under these climate change and sustainable development goals actually looks like, uh, it's called Plandopolis. And this was created for a conference that was going on about Vision uh, Vision 2045 or something like that. It was looking at the world of 2045. And uh, to this day, I don't know the context of this particular video. It's like an animation, almost like a comic book animation kind of thing. Um, I don't know the context of this. I do not know if the creators of this intended this to be creepy Orwellian nightmare dystopia to the max, or if they genuinely believe this is a wonderful way to live in the world. But it's all about this person talking about their daily routine and, oh, today's Friday. That means we get to eat meat. And, uh, uh, the you know, it's about the, the city planners have decided that our, our nephew is going to be a, a city engineer and he's going to work in the waste production plant or whatever. And, and it was it's it's all about how every aspect of these people's lives are micro controlled and i to this day i genuinely don't know if the creators of this video think this is a great idea or if they're saying no this is a nightmare because i see it as the nightmare but i know there are people out there because it hits the right buzzwords will actually think that, that this is something to strive towards i want to finish off on something away from the world economic forum but definitely in the realm i released a an episode today with our friend Vin Armani and it was just he and I 
talking. It was just a live stream, and we were just talking back and forth for an hour and 45 minutes. And we were talking about how people have just adapted so quickly to this and how it's become a religion. It's almost spiritual. They're seeing it as magic, and they're waiting for some sort of magic to come along and make them feel safe, like the magic vaccine. I, I just released an episode on Monday with Dr. Knut Witkowski, who says, I have two supplements that I'm going to fuse together. They'll go into your bloodstream. They're lipids. They'll collect the viruses. It'll excrete through your urine. You do this before. They, what, as soon as they announce something's in the air, start taking this. It'll solve all of your problems. And I told Vin, I said, that's just too simple. It's too simple for people now. They need magic. So the question I wanted to ask, the question I wanted to ask you, and that sounds like magic, but it's not magical enough because it's not. It's coming from a retired, you know, epidemiologist. He, he's not standing next to you know the president or some. You know, he's not wearing a white coat. When you see the way people are acting, is there any way, any argument that you can make that? Agorism is not the way. We just need to vote harder and get the right people in there. <laughs> That's a joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, vote harder, guys. Uh, no, but you, you touch on a couple of really, really fundamentally important points there that I want to underline. One is this presumed health authority Trust the science, which is just such a garbage phrase that was designed to in, to uh, lock in the minds of a certain percentage of the population. Uh, Derek Bros over at the Conscious Resistance, the Last American Vagabond, he just had a, a, a article on this that I thought hit the point just perfectly. Are we living in an anti-science uh, society or something along those lines? And his point is, they keep saying that anyone who's who questions anything of these presumed health authorities, these unelected health authorities, where do they come from? Why are they dictating every aspect of my life? Oh, who cares? They're the they're, trust the science. Uh, they like to say that anyone who defies our orders is anti-science. Uh, well, no, actually, because you you can point to this scientist or Newt Witkowski or this scientist or this scientist or this scientist, uh, and that would so really you can make the argument that they're not they're denying the science. They're the science deniers because science, of course, is not a singular noun. This thing that exists and you, you know, I'm denying that. No, it is a process. It's messy. There are conflicting opinions. So if you deny that, you are denying science. I think that's a that's maybe one way that you can get past the indoctrination that people are under right now. And I'd like, I, I, I'll try it out. I'll let you know how it works if I can unlock some minds that way. Um, but secondarily, you, you touch on this idea of, uh, of this religion, essentially, that people are looking for this spiritual, magical thing to transform, transmute their lives. That's what 2020 is all about, the transformation. And I, I, I would have, even just a few days ago, I think I would have taken that metaphorically to some extent. I now, I now literally really see, palpably see the, the sort of, the the religious, the quasi pseudo religious nature of what is happening right now, and it hit home in the weirdest way. I listened to this comedy podcast called "How Did This Get Made," where they listen to or they watch uh, you know B movies and you know just make jokes about them. It's a, you know, just one of my silly things that I do to unplug. But I was listening to one of their you know their 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 mini episodes as they call them, and it was this special episode where they're talking about social justice or whatever, and. So it started with this weird moment. How did this get made, listeners? My name is June. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I want to start our conversation today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I am on in my home, the Tongva tribe and their elders past and present. And as so many of our listeners are listening, folding their laundry on walks with their dogs, all over this country, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this country, the indigenous peoples and their elders past and present. I also want to name that today my highest intention is that my words and language do not ca cause harm to my guests or to those listening in. And I and I recognize that. Like, I have seen this before. This is prayer. This is what they're doing. They're doing a prayer of sorts. This is a spiritual thing that is happening, a religious 
uh, urge that is being fulfilled by these types of, whether it's the social justice thing or the climate change thing or whatever it is that, or even just COVID-19, trust the scientists, they will, they will protect us. There, there really is a sort of religious side to this that I think, I, yeah, how do you address that? How, what do you do? Because, of course, with just the secularization, secularization of culture generally, human beings are still human beings. I mean, I don't care if you're atheist or not, but humans have this religious, spiritual side to them, whether you think there's anything supernatural or not. That is going to manifest, and it's currently manifesting in these kind of creepy ways that I think are being harnessed for certain political agendas. And that's... That's, I mean, how do you get past that programming? How do you get people out of that matrix? You know, that's that's the prize, I think, for anyone who wants to really deprogram people and uh, get them to step outside of this. I'll let you know when I find the magic decoder ring for <laughs> for getting people to see this. Uh, I'm not I'm not very hopeful at this moment that it's going to happen quickly anyway. I know you have to go. I want to ask you a, qu- a question. I know you can answer very quickly. Did you ever see the David Letterman episode where he had Edward Bernays on. No, what? No, you'll look, look it up on YouTube. One of the, one of the first things he talks about is, um, he talks about wearing a white coat. He goes, and when I wear a white coat, you think I'm an expert. Yeah, you have to look that up. Edward Bernays was actually on David Letterman. That's crazy. I wow. <laughs> I will absolutely look that up. Um, plug plug where people can find your work. CorbettReport.com, C-O-R-B-E-T-T report.com. That's where all my work is completely for free. As I say, people who are interested might want to check out my How and Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentary and some of the other again, just type any of the terms that we've been talking about into the search bar and you'll find probably dozens, if not hundreds of hours of podcasts and what have you on it, all completely for free. Use it as a resource. That's what it's there for. And I will link up to everything that you mentioned today. I appreciate it, James. Thank you so much. Thank you.